So housing is a fundamental need, but finding the right type of housing can be a complex journey. Now, whether you're new to the housing industry or you simply want to become a compassionate investor like me, understanding the different types of housing is key to making an informed decision. So welcome to Live for Free, where we transform lives. And in today's episode, we're going to explore the different types of housing from emergency shelters all the way to tiny homes. And we're going to show you how they fit into the housing continuum. So go ahead and grab your paper so we can get started and jump right in. The first thing that we're going to look at is emergency shelter. Now, emergency shelter is exactly what it is. It's when you're homeless, you find yourself without housing, and you need to find a safe place to be. You're totally in crisis. And we run into individuals like that all the time. And, you know, those individuals who are in crisis are people who are experiencing homelessness. They are escaping domestic violence. They're dealing with some sudden change to their life that requires immediate attention. So those type of shelters provide that immediate care that they need. It's short term, it's just simply meant to meet some basic needs like food and safety while offering them still a bridge to finding something that's going to be more permanent for them um, as a solution. Now I will tell you Shelter is not meant to be long-term. Like I said, it's short. It's not meant to be, you know, there for a few months at a time. But what I've noticed, because we are dealing with a massive amount of homelessness, our shelters are overflowing and they're full to the cap. And now I'll say some of the data might not suggest that because of the way in which they are tracking that, but I can speak firsthand when we, when I ran a shelter, I was always full. We always were full. The issue with that is we bottlenecked. Once we would get individuals in, we would get them stable. We ran into being able to keep to find housing to take them to. So even though that particular system um, provides that immediate need, once it gets bottlenecked, it doesn't allow for other services to happen for other people because they're stuck with nowhere else to go. But the thing I love about emergency shelter is it allows for you to be able to, um, uh, to, to have case management happen for those individuals, being able to assess exactly what they need at that moment and then getting them into um, whatever they need at that moment. Now, I'll say this too in that type of housing, you know, it's what they need from you. It's not about what you need from them. And I say that because when you get individuals in an, in an, in an emergency shelter situation, they're coming in with a variety of different things, whether it's mental illness, addiction, um, drug use, coming out of incarceration, just lost, like they're, all the dynamics that they're dealing with, they're dealing with in that moment. And some of them might not be receptive because they're off their meds. They're not even stable enough to be able to deal with whatever you're coming at. So in those situations, you just have to meet them where they are. As you meet them where they are, you make sure that they're safe and you make sure that they are that they have a place to be. They have shelter and that they're safe. And then as you offer the case management, then you're able to do other things to be able to assist them. Now, transitional housing is a type of housing. And you already know that's my expertise. I could talk about that all day, every day, because I love transitional housing. Um, because it is not emergency shelter, but it's not permanent housing. Um, but there's some nuances even to that. I use, and I like to use the term loosely when I talk about transitional housing, because even though, um, as I use that term, it's when they're in transition, they are basically that bridge between actually having being in an emergency shelter and a long-term situation. That's the best way I can describe transitional housing. However, it's not meant to be long-term either. It's not meant to be, you know, one, two, three, four years long. It's really meant to be anywhere from six to 12 months 
Um, I've seen some places where they operate even less than that, but it's just to get them into, into transition into something that's more permanent. So, um, but I love it because you're able to then focus on specific skills and depending on the type of housing you're offering, whether you're working with people who are dealing with recovery, um, you're working with women who are dealing with domestic violence, you sort of create that programming, those services for them as they are there. So you could be doing life skills, you could be doing financial literacy, job training, but you know, there's so many different things which I'll talk about in the next episode. So be sure to stay on and look for that. But those are the type of things that transitional housing offers that makes it a little different. But that is a type of housing um, that you you get. Another type, and I, I like to refer to this here is like affordable housing. You got public housing for affordable housing, section eight all of that sort of lumped into the same. And what that is, is basically low income housing. Individuals who don't have a lot of money coming in, and that is a form of housing where once you're able to identify someone's specific needs, then you can either get them assistance into section or get them vouchers, things like that. But you got affordable and public housing, and that yet is something you need to consider um, as you think about what type of housing model you want to create. I do know they have what they call low income, I think they call it LIHTC, um, low income and economic Go look it up, LIHTC. Uh, forgive me for not knowing the exact acronym, but um, that type of housing specifically are for individuals who have low income, and they've got actual credits and things like that you can apply for to create that type of housing for individuals. So that is definitely a need if that's something you're thinking about doing as a compassionate investor, but understanding affordable and public housing and all the things that that involves, you must know that. Now there's also permanent supportive housing. So permanent supportive housing is something that is a long-term strategy, but what it does is it provides services for those individuals. So it's still, if you could think of almost like a place where people stay long-term and it's, and then there's like a safety net that catches them. So, cause they need ongoing assistance. It's not just something that they only need for a period of time. They need it permanently. So that's why they call it permanent supportive housing. That is yet another type of housing, um, which you can create a program like that. Most of those permanent supportive housing programs come through, um, HUD or come through your continuum of care, but they truly are catered to meet the needs of those individuals who might be dealing with disabilities or mental health issues on an ongoing basis. And you can definitely create that type of housing model as well that can help facilitate um, individuals who are in need. Now, there's also sober living homes. Um, some people like to call them recovery homes. Um, those are specifically the type of housing for individuals who want to stay in recovery. They want to stay, they want to stay away from um, drugs and alcohol. And I will say this is a protected class as well because you're dealing with individuals with disabilities. That's considered a disability. So being in a protected class gives you a little more liberties. It's just sometimes you have to decide whether that's something you want to battle against or not. Um, but being able to go into your community and determine um, what the criteria is for this type of housing, it's it's definitely available. And you have to then determine what, what, what range of housing you want to offer, whether it's a very low um, level that you can enter in for recovery or it's a high where I think some recovery programs allow for them to use on premises. Um, as a part of the strategy. So just depending on, on what it is you're interested in, that is clearly a place that you can enter into to be able to offer some type of assistance. Now, we're about halfway through uh, talking about the different types of housing and we've got just a few more. So, so I definitely want you to pay attention to the last one that we're gonna share as we talk about these types of housings. But I want you to go ahead and um, don't forget to subscribe. Go ahead and subscribe to my channel and go ahead and hit that notifications button so you will be able to get future videos that I put out as it relates to this type of housing, specifically transitional housing, because I love that and 
also live for free. So definitely be sure to do those things. And then be sure to look in the description below for the events that we've got coming up and also to um, join my school community because I'm excited about the information that we're going to share collectively with a group of you so that we can be able to make a difference in our community that we live in. So jumping back in again, talking about the type of housing. Um, and I like this one because it's similar to some of the stuff that I do. It's called co-housing. Now co-housing is, is different. I'm gonna sort of probably couple these two together because you've got co-housing and then you've got what they call as rooming houses or boarding houses. They're similar in the way in which they're set up, but they definitely are different. The way I like to think of co-housing is more from a community uh, oriented approach. You tend to cater to the community in which you are there and it's like the shared lived experience and mutual support that you have. That's what co-housing is, um, is that shared experience and, and those individuals who truly don't want to be isolated um, there and they want to have like a group that like being able to connect with other people that's more of a co-housing situation where if you're looking at a rooming or a boarding house um, and I've seen both those are truly simply what they are you got a room you this is your space you share a kitchen bathroom and maybe a common area with several other people you might not interact you might not cook together, you might not do things together, but that's simply a rooming house, boarding house. No programming, no nothing tied to it. It's simply a place that is roughly affordable, all utilities included type of situation, but you've got boarding houses, rooming houses that simply are just that. There's no type of programming involved at all. There's no type of community. What I like to think about for myself, that's why when I said earlier about transitional housing and the way, because I mine's like a general term, but I'm like a combination between, it's going to be funny when I say this, I'm a combination between co-housing and I'd probably say more like co-housing and permanent supportive housing because transitional housing, you're still offering services, um, but you may not leave. <laughs> Like I have guys who've been with us for more than 10 years. Now, that is that transitional housing? That's more like permanent housing that gives them some support and they work together as a family. So that's why I said I use my term loosely for transitional housing, but my goal going into the door is it's transitional. It's not meant to be permanent. It's meant to that be that stepping stone from you actually being out of shelter into something a little more stable but not quite permanent but we just have a few guys that still end up being a little permanent so that's why I see and I can clearly see the difference between uh, transitional housing permanent supportive housing co-housing and rooming uh, rooming housing or boarding housing so um, and we can talk more about that I've got a couple of episodes talking about that so be sure to look for my episode on boarding houses the difference between transitional housing and boarding housing be so that you can sort of see some differences in how we operate that now the next type of housing which is also near and dear to my heart is assisted living um, and I like to couple assisted living and nursing homes sort of together because that is a specific type of housing that is catering to our aging population. Individuals who um, may be dealing with even some significant health issues and they need assistance. That is this type of housing. And what I love about this housing, because I love working with seniors especially, um, but I also work, love working with people who might have health needs. Um, and I do more of a, a first level type of approach, um, which is an RCF1, that's considered residential care facilities. Um, and then you got the assisted that's requiring a little more like lifting and caring and taking care of individuals who have serious health needs. But when I think about um, assisted living and working with seniors, we are in what they call right now a silver tsunami. Like it is getting ready to happen. And as you think about being a compassionate investor like I am, this here is the one area you might want to consider because from where we sit today, the amount of housing that's needed for seniors in 
dementia or memory loss, dealing, people dealing with dementia, it's like astronomical, it'll be astronomical as far as a need in the next five to six years. So when you can position yourself in that space to be able to move that to the next level, that is, you could create multiple properties and still never have enough. The need is going to be so great, but I love it because of the level of care. And and it's just something about the assisted living um, piece of this or residential care is the family that you create with these individuals because they're truly your family. They become your family. And that's what I think I love about this model. I've been doing transitional housing for 14 years and just recently got into assisted living or residential care. And honestly, I I already can see myself growing in that space too. So if you're wanting to know more about assisted living, look for that because that's going to be the next thing we talk about is helping you be able to create assisted living facilities that cater to the needs of those who need those services. Now I will say when you're talking about a nursing home and an assisted living, nursing homes are literally like what they call big box. Like, and that's not where my heart is. Um, I would not want to run a 100, 200, 300 facility nursing home because that is a bit much. I like small boutique style housing where they still, because you get better care there. And I like creating that for individuals. So when you can create boutique style assisted living for individuals who need it, you have more, the ratio between the individuals um, is literally like one to six or one to eight, where if you're looking at a nursing home, it's like, the, it's hard to meet all of those needs. So it is still needed in our community because as I said, so when the silver tsunami is get, about to happen, I think that the level of care that you get in an assisted living facility um, definitely meets your needs better. And I've got a book, if you're interested in getting it, I'll put that in the description below um, for families who want assistance in working with their seniors, um, their parents, and getting them into housing. It's called Solving the Senior um, Housing Puzzle. I would love for you to be able to get that and take a look at that so you can see how you can prepare. Because as our parents get older, because that's that silver tsunami that's about to happen, we need to be prepared for that. And this book walks you completely through that. Now, there's another type of housing that's similar to this called Continuing Care Retirement Communities. They call them CCRCs. Now, with CCRCs, Think of it as a community that caters from beginning to end for all the needs of our seniors. So, you know, whether it's them first coming in, they don't need as much care, but as they evolve and they get older, they find that they're going to need a little more care. As And as those needs increase, you simply transition them to assisted living, to nursing care, and that's done all in the same community. Now, that right there, if you're interested in working with seniors and you see yourself being a developer, that is a good place to be as well because you can then hit it all on one particular community and meet the needs as they move along. So as you get them coming in that might not need a lot of care, as they get older, they'll move along with you until they transition. And I think that that's a beautiful place as well um, because you've got hospice, things like that. You can cater to all of that, all in those CCRCs. Now, almost to the end, we've got this one piece here as well um, that speaks specifically about group homes. Now, I know some people who run group homes, which I'm not completely against them at all. I think they all serve their purpose. But group homes are similar to permanent supportive housing because you're still meeting needs of individuals um, based off of um, a, a developmental disability or mental health. So you're still still dealing with that, but they need more structured environment. They need a more structured environment. Those are what group homes offer because it is a supportive community. So if you're, and I do know people who can flip group homes pretty quickly, like 
I, I, I heard of someone, and I've not done it personally, but where they I think they set up like five group homes all within a year. And there's creative ways in which you can do that. If you're interested in group homes, then send me a message on that as well, because I can connect you and make sure that you get what you need to be able to do that properly because of the network of people that I know. Um, I'm pretty much, I, I know a lot about this housing model, several housing models. I can be able to guide you to any one of them that makes best sense for you. And last but not least, because I told you to be looking out for this one. Um, and I will say too, this is not an all-inclusive list because um, there's some others I didn't talk about. Like I won't be talking about modular homes. Let me go ahead and add it real quick before I talk about the last one. Modular homes um, um, or, or the container homes. People are now getting into these container homes now and creating container homes, um, which you can pretty much lump into this one I'm talking about now, which is tiny homes because I love tiny homes. Tiny homes is a great opportunity because it provides for a minimalist lifestyle. Individuals who just want to keep it at a minimum, keep the cost down, and be able to just provide what is needed. And this is really meant for people, like I said, who are in a transitional housing situation and they want to move into something that's a little more cost effective. That's what tiny homes are. And those container homes sort of fall into that same into that same vein, like tiny homes, um, container homes are like that. So you can transition in that and you can afford that because what people are maybe getting on SSI or other type of disabilities, they can afford a tiny home. Um, now, as you listen more to me, there's another model I'll share. I'm not going to share it here. I'll share it later, which is a part of my model that I do. Um, I'll give a hint because the type of housing I do is a model that allows for you to teach individuals how to sustain themselves. So heaven forbid they lost everything. They have no money. They'll at least be able to stay it. Why? Because the type of house they have, the way they're set up is structured where they don't have to worry about that paying a note, it pays for itself in the housing that we've created for them. So we'll talk more about that in another episode. So that's why you need to go ahead and subscribe to my channel. Go ahead and do the notification. So when that video hits, you'll be one of the first to get it. Now these, I've gone through several different types of housing. Hopefully you had a chance to capture those. Thank you so much for tuning in. If you have questions that I can answer, put them in the comments below because I would love to hear from you and I definitely would love even a comment. If you don't have a question but you got a comment or you love something else or you want to, you have another show idea you want me to elaborate on in this space because I'm truly here to be of service to individuals who want to be a compassionate investor like I am and being able to look at different types of of, of, of housing models for you to look at before you can decide on what works is the best way to do that is to explore all of those. So go ahead and look out for more of my episodes. The next one that's going to be coming out is talking specifically about the type of support um, um, opportunities that you can do in your transitional housing. So you go out there and transform your life as you move forward because I truly believe that transformed lives transform the world.